So uh, today we uh, continue our discussion about mechanical properties of uh, iron and steels, the basics of crystal plasticity. And um, we discussed um, last lecture uh, the properties of dislocations in uh, BCC alpha iron. And um, one of the things uh, that is important to remember is that BCC iron, the screw dislocations, uh, so this, this, I should say the screw dislocation segment, so if you have a dislocation loop, parts of the dislocation loop will be parallel to the Burgers vector. Those are called uh, screw segments. Those screw segments, when the temperature uh, is decreased, um, the screw segments have a tendency to align themselves along the Pyrrhals Valley, uh, which are basically uh, the 111, excuse me, 111 directions on 110 planes. And um, when they do that at low temperatures, the the core, the core is split on three, not on one, one one o plane, but on three intersecting one one o planes. And uh, as a consequence, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to move them. And the uh, screw dislocations have a very low um, velocity at low temperatures. And that explains why uh, in uh, BCC iron and many ferritic uh, uh, steels, we see a steep rise in the yield strength and tensile strength, flow strength in general, flow stress in general, of the material as we drop the temperature. Now, at what, when I'm uh, saying low temperatures, um, I, uh, I mean, not that low. Uh, a few degrees below zero, you already start seeing the effects of the low uh, mobility of uh, screw dislocations. And we'll see that that is actually one of the reasons why uh, steels, many steel products, ferritic steel products, low carbon steels, uh, have a ductile to brittle transition temperature. The um, other important thing we need to remember about uh, dislocations in BCC is, again, the same screw segments uh, we were talking about uh, at room temperatures. They will have a tendency, or it will, uh, when they move, when, when they can move, so it's, uh, again, not too low temperatures, room temperatures and thereabouts, the dislocation will easily cross slip. And again, the, the, the dislocation segments that do this easy cross slip are the screw segments. So uh, the, the properties of screw seg uh, dislocations, um, the screw segments of the dislocations are very, very essential to uh, the properties of uh, ferritic steel. Now, um, we also have another class of steel, austenitic steels, uh, uh, and, and you're all familiar with austenitic uh, stainless steels, and they have very different uh, properties. Uh, one of the properties they have, uh, uh, mechanical properties, is that their uh, plastic deformation is uh, due to dislocations, just as in the case of uh, ferritic steels, but these dislocations are dissociated. That means that instead of having a single uh, dislocation gliding on a glide plane. Um, so in FCC, the glide planes are 111 planes always, and the uh, Burgers vectors are in the 011 direction. They're A over 2, 011. Um, so instead of, um, if, if we look at the, the core structure of these dislocations, we see that they actually consist of two partial dislocations. So if, if we look, we would look on the slip plane, we would see one dislocation and then other dislocation, who together form, uh, the two Burgers vectors of these dislocations form this um, 
IU for 2011 uh, dislocation. And the, just for your information, the Burgers factor of the partials is A over 2112. Hmm. Now, um, the result of this so-called dissociation is that in between these two partials, there is a stacking fault. Hmm? And, um, and that has uh, far-reaching consequences for the behavior of um, dislocations in, um, in austenitic stainless steels. Hmm? One of the things uh, that becomes important is the energy of the stacking fault. The energy of the stacking fault, if the energy of the stacking fault is large, we will get a very narrow um, uh, dissociation. That means the two parcels will be very close to each other. If this location density, uh, the, not the dislocation density, the stacking fault energy is low, we'll, the, the two parcels will be far apart. And it, there is also uh, uh, screw dislocations tend to be very uh, uh, closer to each other. The partials and the screw dislocations tend to be uh, closer to each other. And the partials of in the edge dislocations tend to be further apart for the same stacking fault energy and the same Burgers factor. Um, right. And so, uh, so this the, here you can see the. Uh, uh, this uh, dissociation at work, if you want. You see uh, these, uh, this is a, a band of dislocations here, uh, seen in, in austenitic stainless steel. It's a TM foil, so you can actually see the dislocations in this case. And you see these little um, black, alternating black and white stripes here. This region here, it corresponds to the stacking fault. Okay, now the fact that we have a stacking fault um, between the two partial dislocations means that basically it becomes very difficult for dislocation segments to move from from the slip plane to another slip plane um, unless the dislocation, the two partial dislocation, recombine first, yes, and then cross slip. So cross slip is much more difficult in, uh, in FCC uh, austenitic steel. And you can see this readily if you, uh, if you do a simple uh, uh, experiment. You take a stainless steel, a regular stainless steel, and you make a Vickers hardness uh, measurement. So you, you have this little uh, square imprint. And you look at the slip lines that uh, the plastic deformation zone around this imprint uh, looks like. Um, and, and you see these slip lines. And in this, uh, uh, with austenitic steels, you always see very, very sharp slip lines. And the reason is, is because the dislocations do not cross slip or undergo very little cross slip because cross slip would require very high stresses in the case of austenite. So um, that's already one big difference between ferritic steels and austenitic steels is that ferritic steels, the screw segments can easily uh, cross-slip. In the case of FCC, austenitic steels, cross-slip is much harder, much more difficult. Yes, And as a consequence, in BCC you get a um, pencil glide. Yes. In the case of FCC, you get planar glide. Hmm? Right. Now, how, what the, dislo what the, 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 uh, the stacking fault energy is, uh, that's the parameter who d determines how, how far the, the parcels are away from each other, depends very much on the composition. Hmm? So, in, um, for instance, in, uh, Gamma iron, uh, it's about 70 uh, millijoules per square meters. In iron nickel, it depends on the, the amount of nickel. Hmm? So if you have 15% of nickel in that alloy, it's 57. If 60%, it's 70. Um, so it, it's a function of the composition. Okay. Now, if you were to uh, determine the stacking fault energy in not in uh, 
in gamma iron, but in alpha iron, what would you find? Well, actually, you cannot determine it experimentally. The reason is because these stacking faults are huge. So whereas the stacking fault energies are typically, I would say, uh, 30 to 50 uh, millijoules per square meter for, for uh, uh, excuse me, stenitic steels, yes, they are much, much larger, close to 200 millijoules per square meter when we are looking at alpha R. Hmm? So, consequently, dislocations in BCC, i.e. in uh, uh, ferritic steels, no carbon steels, do not dissociate for all practical purposes. Hmm? Um, so, can we um, see the, the effect of cross-slip or absence of cross-slip? Um, when we test um, alpha iron and gamma iron or a ferritic steel and a, a gamma, uh, an austenitic steel um, from a very, uh, in a very pure form. You know? Yes, we can. If, if we would look, would compare the uh, shear stress, shear strain or the stress strain um, curve of single crystals of alpha iron and gamma iron, we would see this difference uh, between the two uh, metals, as it were, hmm? or the two alloys, if you want. So, usually, hmm, if you, uh, yeah, okay, so uh, when, you, when you, let me first say a few things about um, the initiation of, um, of, of uh, slip in single crystals. When, so when you when you deform a single crystal, at the very beginning, not, there are not many dislocations. So you have to initiate the slip. And uh, it turns out, if you look at the pyrrole stress, that the pyrrole stress in, uh, in uh, austenite is lower than in ferrite. Yes? In ferrite. Yes? Then the next thing that happens when you deform uh, your single crystal, providing you have oriented it nicely, is that you have one slip system that is uh, that has the uh, the right condition. I mean, that has the right uh, Schmidt factor, as we say. And um, on that slip system, you start to have glide. You start to generate dislocations, and these dislocations can move freely in the crystal because they're not. All, no other dislocations there. There's very low dislocation density. So um, in, in, that stage is called easy glide. Doesn't take um, forever. However, uh, that's stage one. The the next stage, you have the dislocations start to interact with each other, and we get work interactions, uh, dislocation, dislocation interact, and work hardening. Yes, and eventually, um, it becomes important. Uh, whether dislocations can cross slip or not. And the cross clip allows dislocation to avoid uh, avoid uh, uh, pinning points, yes, uh, circumvent uh, obstacles, etc., such, such as dislocation interactions. And so, what we see is that uh, if, in the case of ferrite, you get a so uh, your material uh, yields, your single crystal yield, you get into a uh, plateau here for the uh, uh, slip, easy slip, and then you get work hardening when the dislocations start to interact. And then actually you get into, um, uh, so for first you get increase in the, the the um, work hardening and then a gradual decrease in the rate of work hardening. In the case of austenite, it's very different. You have a very short uh, uh, primary uh, step here, st stage one, and then a very strong strain hardening. Yes, very strong strain hardening um, in comparison to 
the the the, the ferrite, the BCC iron. The reason is basically uh, the lack of uh, cross slip that occurs in uh, gamma iron. And the dislocations once they uh, because they uh, uh, cannot avoid each other, uh, they will interact very strongly. They cannot cross slip, and um, so you get a lot of work hardening. So important, the pyrrole stress, the pyrrole stress with BCC is higher than SCC. The strain hardening in SCC is more pronounced. And the reason is that the key reason is the limited cross slip. And again, I want to repeat this, the limited cross slip is due to the fact that you have dissociated dislocations. Yeah? Okay. So this, uh, this is a table here that is in the, uh, in the book. Uh, you should have a look at it. Um, I, I don't think I, for this course you need to uh, remember all the crystallography of the slip. That's not necessary. The key things that I do want you to remember is that um, the, the properties of dislocations in BCC iron are important because uh, alpha iron, i.e. ferrite, is a very common um, matrix phase in many uh, commercial steels. Yes? So if you want to look at behavior of ferrite in cold rolling, you want to look at the processing of ferritic stainless steels, you want to understand uh, the deformation properties, for instance, of electrical steels, uh, as I already said, the hot rolling of ferritic stainless steels, etc. Um, you have to uh, look into uh, the specific uh, crystal plasticity uh, property of BCC iron. So important, um, uh, yes, is stacking faults. So there are no stacking faults in the in BCC iron due to very high stacking fault energy. So as a consequence, the slip morphology, you have wavy slip, you have multiple slip system, and you have what we call pencil glide. Hmm? Right? And as a consequence, because this location can so easily cross slip and thereby avoid obstacles or circumvent obstacles, you tend to have a low strain hardening. Hmm? In the case of uh, the properties of FCC iron, gamma iron, are important, for instance, when you're considering the hot rolling of austenitic, uh, of, of regular steel, because that hot rolling is in the austenite stability range. Austenitic stainless steels, of course, are uh, um, have mechanical properties that are fully a uh, function of um, uh, the, the, the uh, crystal properties of gamma iron. And then there, uh, you may think that uh, for red steels, um, you don't need to look at uh, or think about austenite in ferritic steels. That's to a large extent true, but there are many, in particular, advanced uh, high-strength steels that um, are being developed today, and we'll probably get a chance to talk about a few of them um, in later uh, lectures. But these steels contain what is called retained austenite. And retained austenite is austenite that is stabilized at uh, room temperature. Yes? In a a uh, matrix that is mostly ferritic, yes? And that gives uh, these uh, low carbon steels um, very interesting properties. Hmm? So yes, you can have austenite in a ferritic steel uh, as a separate phase. And, um, and of course that austenite will have uh, properties, uh, mechanical properties that are those of, uh, or related to those of gamma R. So what do we remember about uh, the uh, dislocations in gamma iron? Uh, 
first of all, the slip morphology, hmm, because we have this low stacking fault energy, we have dissociated dislocations, yeah? and we have planar glide as a consequence. And the other thing that results from this uh, dislocation dissociation is the fact that we have a high strain hardening, yes, um, uh, because the, uh, we have strong dislocation dislocation interaction. There are other uh, deformation, uh, plastic deformation uh, possibilities other than um, dislocation glide. One of them is twinning. Twinning occurs in uh, BCC iron. The, uh, the way twinning occurs is uh, via dislocation mechanisms. Um, again, this is not being about um, uh, mechanical properties of, uh, of, of materials. I'm not going to go into the, the twinning mechanism in, uh, in detail, but it, the twinning mechanism generally requires two things. Uh, first of all, it requires that you already uh, have some uh, plastic deformation before the, the twinning mechanism can start. Then you need to have dislocation, dislocation interactions, yes, and then you also need high stresses. Hmm? So in general, in BCC iron, we don't observe twinning uh, when we do a regular uh, deformation at, say, room temperature. However, if we do, um, if we do uh, uh, deformations, at lower temperatures and very high strain rates, yes, in these conditions, even uh, 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 regular ferritic steels will twin. Uh, yes, and, and so here uh, you, you see what, what happens uh, during twinning. Um, the twinning plane is not the same as the um, as the, uh, or not necessarily the same as the slip plane. Slip plane in BCC is 110, the twinning plane is 112. So if I look at the crystal, the unit cell, and I look at the one, the atomic uh, uh, configuration on the 110 plane, yes, the slip during twinning, yes, um, requires, so, so uh, that uh, this plane here and then this plane here uh, sh are sheared in this direction. Hmm? Have the same amount of shear, and, uh, and, 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 and this is then what you. Uh, so, uh, actually, I uh, did it the wrong way. The slip should be in this direction. Yes, in this direction. Yes, and then the same amount of shear in this direction. Um, so, um, when, when you do this, hmm? This, the, uh, the, the, you apply twinning shear to all these atoms on this plane, and then you apply the same twinning shear. You end up uh, with this structure after the twinning. And you can see here you have a twinning plane, and the, the structure is perfectly uh, mirrored across uh, this twinning plane. Hmm? Right. So um, the... Uh, Twinning stress is high, and we only see twins at low temperatures. Why is that? Well, let's uh, look at this diagram here. And say you're carrying out, in, on a laboratory scale, you're doing a, uh, a test, a tensile test, at 10 to the minus 3 as a strain rate. So you have, um, what you see is then the, uh, uh, the, the stress, the flow stress, or the yield stress in this case, will increase with decreasing temperature, yes? And um, if I apply a, uh, a deformation, but I do the deformation at a much higher uh, drain rate, say 1,000 per second, it's considerably faster, uh, the, the flow stress gets uh, shifted to a higher value, and uh, as, as you know, that is due to strain rate sensitivity, hmm? phenomenon called strain rate sensitivity. However, hmm, because the um, 
uh, because you have this increase in stress, yes, you can activate the twinning deformation mechanism because you reach at one certain temperature you'll reach the stress needed to activate twinning. So, so for instance, uh, if you do a 10 to minus 3, about um, 100K, so that's you know, very cold, you can achieve um, uh, twinning. Uh, but the temperature can be uh, increased yes, if we do the, uh, the straining at higher uh, uh, strain rates. So, you can see here that the twinning at, at, at uh, this temperature here, hmm, the uh, twinnings below this temperature, the twinning stress is lower than the, the stress required for glide, and you will get twinning below this temperature. Yeah. Okay. Twins are uh, not rare in uh, VCC iron. If we if we have conditions of high strain rates and a low temperatures. Yeah. So, so for instance, if you, uh, you uh, and I'm sure um, some of you must be uh, familiar with the, the so-called Sharpie test. Uh, the Sharpie test is a uh, toughness test that you carry out at different temperatures. Well, very often uh, the, um, the samples that you deform at very low temperatures, at low temperatures, because they are tested at very high strain rate, they will have twins. They will contain twins. In contrast to the um, twinning in uh, ferritic steels, twinning is very common, or much more common, let's put it this way, in uh, austenitic stainless, in, in austenitic stainless steel, and austenitic steels in general. Hmm? And again, the process of twinning is is again a dislocation um, mediated uh, shear um, of shearing of the lattice mm -hmm. um, and so let's say um, in the case of gamma iron you can do the same um, uh, as what I did for the just did before uh, previously did for a, a, a ferrite so uh, this would be uh, a view of 111 planes in uh, austenite, and this is the, the, the twinning shear, yes, the twinning shear, which uh, is actually the same shear, the shear as the, uh, or same shear as the shear for partials in the, uh, in the uh, dislocation of a dissociated dislocation. So you shear this whole plane by this vector, yes, Yes, and you obtain this here. So th this whole uh, column here is now displaced to this position. And you repeat this same, the shear su on successive lattice planes. Yes, you do a second shear on this one here, on this plane. All the atoms move to the left, yes, and you, s you slowly build up a twin. And so here you can see this little uh, block of material now is a twin. And if you look across the twin plane, you can see that the, the structure is, is mirrored across this plane. Um, so t twins are much more common in, in uh, austenite, and um, they're interesting because they can act as very efficient uh, obstacles to dis dislocation motion. And uh, there are some steels uh, which, which use this to, um, to increase the strengthening. So some examples here, austenite, um, austenite, the two examples here, the two pictures here on top are austenite, yes. Um, in uh, austenitic stainless steels in particular, you see a lot of, uh, if you look at the microstructure, so-called recrystallization twins. So you see these parallel lines here, these are twins. If you look in, high resolution electron microscopy you can see uh, the the perfect alignment of these uh, the rows of atoms across the twin boundary as as uh, explained with the little uh, picture schematic on the previous slide 
Similar things are observed in the case of uh, ferrite, but not as commonly, uh, only when you do deformations at very high strains and very low uh, temperatures. And uh, they're uh, sometimes called Neumann bands. You can see they're, and they're very, very, uh, in contrast to the recrystallization twins in gamma iron, they're very narrow twins. All right. So we have dislocations that give us um, uh, uh, give a possibility for crystals or grains in ferritic steels or in austenitic stainless steels to uh, deform plastically. Um, in addition, we have other uh, plasticity mechanisms such as twinning. Uh, so what what about these dislocations? Um, themselves, mm? uh, their interaction, mm? and their interaction with atoms. Mm? Well, first of all, we have to realize that a dislocation has is surrounded by a stress field. Mm? For instance, this is the stress field of a an edge dislocation, and here an edge dislocation, and here a screw dislocation, yeah, on the right here, for uh, an alpha arm mm? calculated. Mm? Yeah. And you can see that um, the, uh, for the edge dislocation, mm, uh, we have computed the, the contours of the stresses and um, we find that, for instance, the, above the slip plane, the, uh, the crystal structure is in compression. And that's due to the presence of this extra half plane. And the reverse is true below the glide plane. There, the, the structure is in dilatation. Um, yes. In the case of a screw dislocation, a little bit more complex, you have uh, regions of dilatation and compressions uh, that form this hexagonal pattern here, these hexagonal lobes, as it were, yeah, along the dislocation. And um, uh, yes, and, and so you have uh, regions that are under compression, just like uh, this region here, and regions that are in in dilatation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if two dislocations are um, in each other's vicinity, these stress fields will will interact. Yes, and the, the way they um, uh, they interact, it can be very different depending on their relative positions. And um, this is illustrated here, hmm, where you have for two edge dislocations, you have two edge dislocations with the same Burgess vector. This means that they're basically the same dislocations except their, 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 their position is different. Hmm. And you're looking at uh, the interaction as follows. You, you keep one of the dislocation in the origin of this uh, xy plot. And then you, you change the position of the other dislocation. And the other dislocation uh, is at position xy, yes? And uh, so that can be anywhere in this plane. Hmm? So, um, but obviously, if the dislocation is along this, uh, line here, x equals to y, yes, I will have x over y is 1. Hmm? For dislocations that are lying along this diagonal. Hmm? So this calculation here shows me that if x over y is 1, the interaction between the two is 0. That means that they're, they will not interact, but only in this position. Yes. What happens if the dislocation is here or there? Well, in this case, y over x, excuse me, x over y, yes, x over y will be smaller than 1, yes, because y in, in this region, y is always larger than x. And in this region, x over y hmm, will be larger than 1. Okay, So in this case, for instance, that uh, 
corresponds to the region here, x over y is smaller than y, we get an attraction. That means that the dislocations will attract each other. So in this case, the dislocations will tend to form to get closer to each other, but they have to stay on the same glide plane. So I will be forming this kind of structures. The dislocations will align themselves as close as possible to each other, uh, but as they uh, uh, cannot move up or down, uh, they uh, kind of uh, align on top of one another. In the case of, um, in, in this situation, yes, in this situation here, where x over y, x over y is larger than 1, yes, so that is in this, see, when the dislocation is in this region here, yes, um, I get repulsion. So the dislocations uh, uh, push each other away. So, so for instance, if you have two edge dislocations on the same glide plane, yes, they will have a, a, you will experience a very strong repulsion yes so as you try to bring two dislocations on the same glide plane closer to each other yeah, closer to each other the repulsion force will increase yes okay so that uh, so very important dislocation interact always um, they can interact and then they will form structures. They will structures such as this structure here, which we call a low angle grain boundary. Or, for instance, when they're on the same glide plane, you will have a strong repulsion. Hmm? Okay? So that's one of the things that dislocations do. Another thing that dislocations do is they will uh, intersect. They can intersect each other and when they do that, um, they, you can create, you create what is called a jog, a jog in the dislocation. And certain jogs are what we call sessile. Hmm? And sessile means that the, that little piece of dislocation that you have created by the intersection cannot glide, cannot move. And it basically works as a pinning point. So for instance, um, if we um, uh, look at this, uh, this so-called dislocation interaction where they intersect each other, we can have, uh, I think, um, for instance, two uh, edge dislocations interacting in uh, the way in, in the way that's shown here. So this dislocation. Uh, is this one is stationary and this location is on another glide plane and moves upward here. When it crosses this dislocation, it forms an edge jog. Yes? Okay. The um, uh, uh, if I have uh, dislocations that um, for instance, no, this is the same dislocation here, but now the intersection uh, is the intersecting dislocation goes from this side. Yes, I create hmm, a uh, screw jog, so the dislocation uh, segment stays in the glide plane. That's important, and here also. Yes, the interesting thing about edge jogs, yes, is that they, um, uh, they, they can act as pinning points to the dislocations. So, so jogs are always formed when dislocations and So if, if we have, as I explained here, two edge dislocations hmm, with Burgess vectors at right angles to each other, we produce an edge type jog. If we have two edge dislocations with parallel Burgess vector, like in this case, yes, we create screw type jogs, yes, and, and they're mobile. Hmm? Now, if we have two screw dislocations that interact, they will produce 
two chunks. Yeah. And um, in particular, in this case, hmm, the um, uh, you, you can have switch with the Burgess vector hmm, and its jog are not coplanar. Hmm, and in that case, the jog acts as a strong pinning point because you create a small segment of dislocation on a glide plane and the Burgess vector of that dislocation does not belong to that glide plane. So that little piece of dislocation cannot move and works as a, as a, um, a pinning uh, point. For instance, here you can see uh, you have a screw dislocation here yes, and, and here after the, the interaction between with another dislocation has formed this jog. Now, the Burgess factor of this dislocation hasn't changed. So let me redraw this as a larger. So, yes. so uh, this is a, the Burgess factor of this dislocation. This is also the Burgess factor of the edge jog here, edge jog here. But the edge jog is not lying on this this glide plane, as you can see. It's lying on another glide plane, this one here. Yeah. So um, that little piece of dislocation, how small it looks like, acts as a very effective obstacle uh, to uh, dislocation motion because it cannot move itself. Okay. Right, so what do we know about locations? They um, uh, make plastic deformation possible, permanent. They uh, interact with each other because they're surrounded by stress fields. Um, and their interaction can be purely these stress fields. Yes. Uh, and, and thirdly, they uh, uh, can intersect each other. And a lot of time it doesn't really matter because they, they can cut each other as it were. But sometimes um, uh, you get situation where they create a little piece of dislocations, dislocation that is sessile, that, that works as an obstacle to motion. Thirdly, slip makes, uh, creates, can be the source of um, texture. So how does this work? Um, well, uh, that is because um, of what we call crystal rotation crystal rotation. So when you deform material, yes, the fact that um, you have slip, yes, which requires sh uh, shear, and the fact the material is constrained in some way will result in crystal rotation. Let, let me give you a very simple example with um, this uh, single crystal here. So you say you have a single crystal of alpha iron. You're, you're pulling with this force left to the left to the right and to the left here, yes? And you have slip system that's activated here, those planes here. So if, um, if the, the shear is in this direction, the crystal, you, you will have, uh, the crystal will uh, slip on, this, on these planes yes, in this particular direction, yes? And you can see the crystal will now be longer, yes? We have long, uh, longer, so you'll have plastic deformation strain. Hmm? However, note that when I do this on my piece of paper, um, I will not only displace the top surface to the uh, right, but I will also displace the axis of my crystal to uh, downwards. Of course, when I deform a single crystal, I, I, it's constrained to the the top and the bottom part of my crystal is constrained, is not allowed to move sideways. They're not allowed to move sideways because that's where I have my grips. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, I have to um, keep the axis uh, straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see is that as a consequence, these uh, little bits of um, uh, uh, parts of the, the crystal will actually rotate. They will rotate, yes, away from the uh, the tensile axis. 
And it's, it's this rotation that um, allows for, or, or is, is the source of uh, te crystallographic texture. And we, we are very interesting, interested in this uh, possibility because crystallographic textures in, in iron and in steels allow us to uh, work with the uh, formability, change the formability of the material. It's, let's say, um, for instance, um, we, um, we look at two situations, yeah, two situations. We look at a situation where we have a single crystal orientation, yes, the one that's shown here. And the crystal is oriented in such a way hmm, that the slip, yes, is as follows. The slip direction is in the plane of this little plate, yes, towards the left. So in this case, um, the, um, uh, uh, so the, the crystal thickness, yes, the crystal thickness does not change. Yes. And so if I look at this and I say, well, what is the ratio of the uh, width thickness relative to the thickness uh, strain? Well, the, in the region where slip has occurred, I, I could compute the width strain, but so it's got a little bit smaller, so that's a, a certain value, let's call it A. But the, th the, the, the thickness strain is, is zero, right? Zero. So in principle, I get huge, very large uh, values for this ratio, width strain over thickness strain if I have a single crystal that deforms. So, and I will go, um, I, uh, you already know that this kind of uh, ratio I call the R value. Hmm? So in this case, I get very high R values. Now say I have another single crystal, yes, which is oriented in such a way that the slip direction is now, the slip goes in this direction. So, um, um, the, uh, the slip, hmm? goes uh, in such a way that I have no width, no width change in my crystal, and I do have a thickness change in the region, of course, where slip has occurred. So in this case, in this particular case, the R value will be zero, because the width strain is zero in this case. Yes. So, and that is indeed what you will find, depending on the orientation of the, these crystals, yeah, you can have, <coughs> excuse me, a normal anisotropy, so the, the ratio of the wet strain to the ratio of the thickness strain of single crystals uh, change. Hmm? So for instance, if I have a single crystal where the surface is the surface is so the surface is a one 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 surface, and the axis along which I apply my stress is along one one zero to be correct one bar one zero. Then this will be the variation of the R value in the plane. Of, uh, of this crystal. Hmm? So I get a high R values, high R values. Hmm? If for, uh, I have a, a crystal now where the orientation the, of the, this plane here is 011 and the direction of the strain is tensile stress is 110, then I find R values that are much lower, yes? So the question is, if you look at this and you know you want to have a material or yes, a plate or sheet material with a high R value, you would want to have a high R value because you don't want thickness strain. Because if you have lots of thickness strain in your crystal or in your sheet material, 
it means that you'll have fracture very quickly because the material will thin and break. Yeah? So you can see that what you would rather have is that your grains have this kind of orientation. Yes? And this is what is basically done when you're doing texture control in steels, and ferritic steels uh, in particular, is you try to have any grains with this type of what we call texture component. Mm, texture component one, 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 uh, one bar, one, zero. Mm. So large values of R correspond to smaller thickness reductions, yes, and that's very favorable in deep drawing applications. Mm. Right, and uh, it's, it's well uh, known that uh, you have, um, if you that you can calculate these things, the R value, the, nor the so-called normal anisotropy for different um, texture components. Yes. And, if, and, and, and so remember, we want two things. We want a high R value. And then we don't want the R value to touch too much in the plane of the, the sheet. So we do want to have a very low planar anisotropy. So let's look at this table and say, well, uh, technically we use the mean R value, Rm. And we use delta R, which is given by this here, to uh, look at the uh, planar anisotropy. So you want this factor to be high and you want this factor to be low. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this uh, here. Let's look at very high. Well, this is a high value. Um, these are high values. Okay. Uh, this is also high value. Mm -hmm. And let's then look at which one we would rather have because we have other condition that we'd like to have is we want to have a low delta R value. So this is already a component we don't want at all because uh, it's, it may have a very high R value, but it has a, a, horrible, a horrible, excuse me, delta R value. Um, this component, 111112, has a 2.6 as a mean R value and a Planar anisotropy is zero. That's so. That's really good. Yes. So is the one 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 zero. So these two are good. And um, and this one here five five four two two five is also uh, interesting. Um, but these are the main two texture components that we want to have in uh, in sheet material. So we'd like to have our grains. Many of our grains. Um, with that particular orientation. Okay, so we, we try to achieve this by uh, you know having a, a, a fully um, ferritic um, hot rolled material. Hmm? In this particular case, uh, uh, cold rolled, yes, enough, hmm? um, and then generate one 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 parallel to the surface of the sheet, yes, in a normal direction, and 111 one, 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 one in the normal direction, excuse me, and then 110 one, oh, or 112 one, in the rolling direction, yes. And you obtain that after the recrystallization of this uh, cold rolled microstructure. Okay. So do we want uh, random? Not really. We'd like to have textured material, so the crystals should have uh, orientations which are uh, favorable for forming, yes. I do want to take last uh, few minutes to say a few things about um, the way uh, texture results are presented, because it's texture Crystallographic texture is a, is a science in itself. Study of crystallographic texture is a science in itself. Uh, but I, I do want to, uh, for those who are not familiar with so-called orientation distribution function concept, give a, a very, very uh, short uh, introduction to the, to the topic. So, um, so, so basically, um, that's, that's the, uh, the challenge. Is how do you represent texture? in a 
a polycrystalline material like steel. Yeah? Well, uh, say, you, say, say just we have uh, sheet material, so this is the sheet, hmm? this is the rolling direction, and this is the normal direction to the sheet, and this transverse direction. And, and what, again, what we would want to have is our grains here in the sheet, yes, should be preferably oriented with the following orientation, the 1, 1, 1 normal direction, and the uh, 1, 1, in the rolling direction. So say we, we have achieved this uh, for this particular grain. So we take this little plate with that particular grain and we put it in the middle of a big, big sphere, which we call reference sphere. Yes? Yes. And um, we uh, focus now on um, the uh, x, x, y, and z axis of our unit cell. Hmm? Right? And we uh, extend them hmm, until they intersect this reference sphere. Hmm. And then we uh, connect this intersection yes, with the uh, lowest point here in my, uh, on this reference sphere. Yes. And then uh, what we do next is we define a projection plane. That's the equatorial plane here. Yes. And where these blue lines intersect the equatorial plane, we, we put a dot, yes? And um, so that plane now, that projection plane, that equatorial plane, that will give me, for that particular orientation, yes, a pattern, yeah, a pattern. And uh, I call this pattern a pole figure, yeah? a pole figure. Yeah? So, so if I look at this projection plane, yes, for the single grain I just discussed, I, I now look down on it. This is what I would see. I'd see my normal direction sticks out, a rolling direction is uh, up, and my transfer direction is to the, the right. That's for a single grain. Now, if I uh, would repeat this for many grains, yes, and the grains are not exactly in that particular orientation, but close enough, hmm, I would get um, many yellow dots that were would be close to these original three dots, yes? And I could do my mathematically, um, uh, by mathematical construction, uh, describe this distribution of points by means of a what we call a pole density. These points are called poles, and I can describe the pole density. And I can say, well, you know, if they were, if if, if the pole density was random, uh, the the intensity would be zero. If it if it's uh, one times higher than randomness. This level, two times randomness, three times randomness, four times randomness. I can uh, describe the intensity, the strength of the texturing by, meal, uh, by means of this pole density. Hmm? And then, then, of course, because this is not very convenient, this 3D um, uh, uh, representation, I would get 2D representation and have pole density contours. And what I have here is a well known pole figure. And it tells me basically that um, a lot of the grains have a 111, 110 orientation, not exactly but very close. Yes? Now, uh, by doing this, this pole figures, um, I, I don't display all the texture components, the texture components that I miss. Yes? And um, in order to have um, a view of all the possible texture components that are actually in uh, in the crystal, yes, in the, or in, excuse me, not in the crystal, in the in the sheet material, I would need to take many pole figures, yes. And so, in in order to avoid this, we we have we use an alternative representation, and that's the orientation distribution function, which allows you to actually see all the texture components in one uh, view. Hmm? So the, the way you, uh, you do this 
is by, is, is by um, just noticing that um, you have two uh, orthogonal uh, um, set of axes. axes. One is what we call the, the, the one that's related, that's attached to your, oops, to your specimen, with as th there your, your three vectors are the ring direction, the normal direction, and the transverse direction. And then the other orthogonal um, uh, set of axes are the, uh, the axis of your qubit unit cell. And so the relative orientation of these two um, axes it can be expressed by means of Euler angles. Yes? And that's what the or orientation distribution function does. It expresses the orientation of each crystal here yes, in terms of their three Euler angles, capital Phi, Phi 1, and Phi 2. Yes? Okay. So let's say we have a... Um, and, and, and that's the way you, you, you make an orientation distribution function. So it's a three-dimensional repre three di three representation of the distribution of the texture components. Yeah? And you, it's, it's basically based on the same measurements that you make to obtain uh, pole figures, so diff which are basically diffraction experiments. Yeah? And, um, and the orientations are represented by angles in Euler space. So what is Euler space? Euler space is basically a, uh, a space where you have a origin here, and then you have the angle phi 1, the angle phi 2, and the angle phi 3. Yes. And any point in this space defines an orientation with respect to the sample um, uh, axis yeah, that you'd have defined. For instance, if we have a, a cube orientation, right, this is cube orientation, obviously um, uh, the x, y, and z axis of the, the cube are parallel to the x, y, and z axis of my um, uh, sheet here. So phi 1 is 0, capital phi is 0, and phi 2 is 0. So the um, uh, the, the cube uh, orientation would be would be located here. If I have a rotated cube, I rotate this cube by 45 degrees. Then phi one is zero, phi two is zero, phi, uh, capital phi is zero, and phi two is 45 degrees, etc. You know, I, for other orientations, you can uh, do it also. But let's have a look at say uh, this important. Uh, uh, texture component, which is a high R value, the 111121, that has phi 1 is 0, phi, capital phi, is 54.7 degrees, and phi 2 is 45 degrees. So uh, in this uh, diagram, in the, the Euler space, I'm look, I, I look for phi 1, 0, so that's here, this plane. I'm looking for phi 2, um, uh, sorry, uh, capital Phi, uh, 54.7 degrees, so this way, and then, sorry, um, Phi 2, um, uh, yes, uh, Phi, excuse me, Phi 2, um, um, let's do this again, um, Phi 1, 0, that's here, so uh, phi 2, 45 degrees, that's this here, that's 45 degrees. And then phi, 54.7, that's in this direction. So this direction here is this um, um, texture component rather, rather than the one I, I wrote here. Uh, this one here. So this, this actually should be corrected. It should be 1, 1, oh, yes. The um, 1, 1, 2 is a few degrees further up, yes, to the right here. Okay. okay. So um, 
again here, um, the um, uh, orientations, yes, the grains, the, the uh, individual grains will appear as points. When you have strong texturing, these points will form, uh, will line up along lines or form clusters at certain uh, places. And so these are, this is a single grain is uh, a dot. Many grains will allow you to create density contours, yes? And the density contours uh, tell you what the orientation, uh, what favored orientations you have in your crystal. And in, typically for the uh, for alpha iron or for um, rather for polycrystalline uh, materials such as steels, ferritic steels, we use the 45 degree section of Euler space because there you have the, all the important um, um, texture components that you form in um, in uh, in steels, in particular ferritic steels. So uh, let's see here um, the, um, the the two the component we were just discussing uh, and make this little error. Um, so which has um, if I can go back so phi phi one zero uh, capital phi fifty four and phi two forty five degrees. Oops, wrong direction. So I'm looking for phi one equals to 45 degrees, so, sorry, phi 2 equals to 45 degrees, phi 1 is 0, yes, and then capital phi is 54 degrees, 54.7 degrees, yes. so let's, let's look where that is, so this is 10 20, 30, 40, 50. This, this line here is, has phi um, 54 degrees, it's capital phi, and then phi 1 equals 0, so that means it's along this line, that's, this line has, this is, is surface is phi 1 is equal to 0, and um, and, and this is the, the section that we make, yes, is at um, is uh, 45 degrees. So, so what, what we basically see is the, um, we, we have a plane that, that go right, uh, crosses right through this, this uh, um, texture component. So, and if we now look at the texture components, we see in this particular case, we see uh, intensity contours, and we see a very high intensity in this particular case at this position and at this position. Yes, and that is exactly along the line where phi capital phi is 54.7, hmm? and um, we can see here that rather than uh, 11111 oh, have, uh, uh, being a major uh, texture component is 111 one, uh, one bar to one that is a major component. And, but you can see the other texture components in, the, um, in this ODF. All right. So um, let's end uh, the lecture uh, here and we'll, uh, next lecture we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, repeating what I've just said. Uh, quickly now, and uh, and see how we use the ODFs in, in practice when uh, when it comes to steels and um, informable steels in particular. So thank you for your attention.